I would like to use the time to speak about the hearing in Karlsruhe at the Constitutional Court. Uh, you may have heard that the, the Chaos Computer Club um, handed in a statement about uh, the law. Again, I didn't catch which law it is. I'd like to talk about the fact about the state Trojan, to what extent it was involved, what arguments we were using. Um, we appeared in the oral hearing. We have a written statement, which you can, of course, find at ccc.de. And, of course, near the end, I would like to just get out the crystal ball and, and f wonder what will come out perhaps in autumn, hopefully by the end of the year. And that's what I would like to talk about. I think the reporting on the day in July wasn't that bad. There, were, there was coverage across the country, uh, but it was just a few hours and the arguments that were exchanged. Well, they are quite interesting. And uh, to get some information about the critical points in this um, law about the <coughs> about the Federal Criminal Police Office. Uh, Ulf Bumay was supposed to join me because he was another expert that was heard uh, talking for Amnesty and Netspolitik.org, but somehow he seems to have got lost in his tent. So I'll have to do this alone. I will just go on a bit of, a, a bit of an arc because that's straight... Trojan, of course, has a, some history that I would like to talk about. Not everyone would know every detail, but I'll try not to extend it too much. Uh, to begin with, I would uh, like to quote the, the ruling on the state Trojan. This is from 2008, which and, and did not find the attention that it would have deserved. The state Trojan has been in Karlsruhe uh, at the Constitutional Court um, as part of the law on the Interior Secret Service in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. And uh, that led to a ruling uh, that created a new fundamental right, which was derived from the rights in the Constitution, the basic right for ensuring the confidentiality and integrity of information technology. Um, and... Uh, it was the CCC's publicity by the state Trojan that really caused this to enter the debate. Um, the interpretation of that ruling, uh, which is more than six years old now, is something that leaves me somewhat unhappy because many nuances in that ruling uh, have not entered legal practice in the, at the national or federal state level. It's not just about the state Trojan and which systems can be infiltrated with with what means, but it was also discussed uh, what searches of hard disks, uh, what the thing is about that. And but um, it hasn't really entered legal practice and legal writings. So I would like to mention this ruling again and the hearing now in Karlsruhe of course, goes beyond that in what it debated, simply because the facts in 2008 were not known as much as they are now concerning the details of the technical implementation of the state Trojan. And of course, two years of Snowden and the debate about IT security and malware and perhaps automatic spreading of malware, um, the uh, alleged omnipotent of secret services, of course, all played a part in, in the current, in the recent debate. And in the night before that hearing, uh, the data of the hacking team hack uh, went public, and I was desperately looking through the night uh, for hints in, in those hundreds of gigabytes of data that I collected from each and everywhere about uh, buying uh, Germany buying malware from hacking team. And I did actually find something, and live in Karlsruhe, I was able to mention this. Uh, several uh, federal state police officers and the Federal Criminal Police Office did have 
at least some business relations maybe were shown their malware. So the law about the Federal Criminal Police Office was passed in the previous parliament in 2008. And uh, that was two parliaments ago. And it's uh, it's the, the bracket before the law. It's, it's, it's about authorizations before legal proceedings start, before someone is pursued for a, a concrete suspicion. And this is all referring to what's called international terrorism, which in the constitutional complaints, uh, which we complained about, uh, because it has not been defined at all, that's this term. In particular, international terrorism, uh, so that is kind of the birth defect of this law. There are certain author authorizations for intrusion, state trojan, dragnet surveillance, uh, communication surveillance, internet surveillance, observation, all that. If you allow all this, it would be nice to have a good definition what that kind of international terrorism should be. Uh, so the complainants were complaining about that. There are two complaints that were discussed. The first one um, that we have now stated with uh, their file reference, Gerhard Baum and Burkhard Hirsch, two well-known liberal politicians, have uh, submitted many constitutional complaints, both former ministers and then a member of the former Green Parliamentary Party in the Bundestag, now, of course, twice exchanged. Wolfgang Wienand and Claudia Roth were there. And they were raising somewhat different aspects, but very fundamentally criticizing this law and had written it down. These complaints, in part, can be found online. At least the arguments can be. I'm not going to enter into individual legal uh, deliberations. These are always debated at a very high level in Karlsruhe. There's not a lot of explanations that you get. Uh, of course, these are mostly legal experts arguing with each other that really know their stuff. I will talk about technical details, particularly when they, as they depend on each other in a certain way. I can't reference everything. This took several hours. I couldn't stay on t until the end because I had to get on the train back to Berlin. I missed the last hour. There was there was such a wealth of, of problems, legal complicated problems that were debated. And not all of them could actually be processed. But I will show, um, I will, continue on my arc before I start with the actual hearing um, because of course the state Trojan which I won't talk about in detail but I would at least like to say what it's basically about it is state sponsored malware that either spies on telecommunication or is supposed to allow access to a computer's hard disk. So the way it goes normally is you analyze the target system, uh, you put together that software, normally you have a, a contractor for that, you try and enter the software into the system either remotely or in the cases that we investigated as CCC later in by gaining physical access to the computer. For example, uh, an airport control where the computer was shortly taken out of sight of the owner and, and the software was inserted. So you have a control component. And fifth, I uh, mentioned removal. But of course, we wouldn't have found the binaries of the state Trojan. So removal seems to be optional. But it is actually envisaged. In authorities lingo uh, this is called remote forensic software which is strange because it's not just about forensics uh, because certain rules guidelines about forensic techniques if you ask to secure evidence are not really kept uh, so this is not really a forensic investigation at all in an IT sense there is a distinction that in my thinking is artificial, but it has been found in all the papers since 2008 that you get from the authorities, and that is the distinction between the uh, 
uh, so-called castrated state Trojan, the sources, telecommunications, surveillance, that kind of Trojan is to be is to monitor just communications and then the so-called online searching. This most stupid term that you could think about because nothing is being searched online there, which allows full access. Online searching has much higher legal and technical hurdles to overcome. The source telecommunication, telecommunications monitoring is normally compared with uh, telecommunications surveillance. To counter that argument was important to us. Even in 2008, the CCC was there as an expert in that complaint. And of course, this time we stressed this as well, that uh, very shortly though, um, how our technical argument went, I would like to say, but it, it goes through this draft law as well. There's always this distinction, would you like to use the state written just for telecommunication surveillance or for searching all of the hard disks, the whole computer? And I have a quote from 2007. There was this long catalog of questions that the interior and justice ministers had to answer. Uh, where they always stressed that uh, it could never be expected that the RFS, which is uh, authority speak for state Trojan, it could never be expected that it could be discovered. That, of course, was then falsified, and that was the elephant in the room at Karlsruhe, because clearly with that detailed analysis that we were able to make, certain things could no longer be denied. Certain arguments that we had heard in 2008 were not repeated now. Uh, the analysis became part of the files, entered the uh, evidence. Some technical facts simply couldn't be denied anymore. I brought the picture here, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, uh, what this Digitask Trojan could do. Just to summarize, uh, according to our analysis, which you can read about, you can, of course, find it at ccc.de, and which was also handed in as part of the arguments. So this is not source telecommunication surveillance. It was full search. Uh, components could be loaded. Uh, and this was blatant, uh, blatant flaws in, in the way this was implemented. Mistakes in the Trojan, there was unencrypted communication. Uh, the data communications happened via command and control center in the US. So other jurisdictions were involved. The exploit exploitability by third parties was surely given. We built our own command and control server. And the authorities, uh, we had a certain kind of pre-warning uh, which we gave to the authorities before we published our material, together with the Frankfurt Frankfurt Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung, um, we gave them certain warning, and they were not able to take out this command and control server during that time. So, surely there were a lot of technical flaws, technical inability, and there was a remote control functionality to to load further components, and execute any kind of malware that you could load or remove. So the debate immediately was about the manipulation of data, uh, the concealing of data, deleting of data, all that would have been technically possible. So from our side, uh, this was a reverse engineering project. So of course, we can, can't really say from the binary analysis what was actually done, because we didn't have the source code uh, or an, an, a monitoring of the operation of that software, but we had that technical opportunity, uh, particularly according to the to the ruling from 2008 saying that, uh, that what happened was not according to the law, and that had been recognized. Uh, the 2008 ruling clearly says that not just legal, but also technical restrictions have to be there. And it turned out, well, there were some larger questions as well that, in general, concerned software security because of the flaws in the way the software was written, but also um, secure logging. If in a criminal procedure against a suspect, and we're talking in particular about one case, a pharmaceutical export-import company uh, the whole company was uh, supposed to be involved in organized crime and, and pursued. 
and in the subsequent case, you would like to know how securely you've uh, found the evidence, how how much you can prove that you really have the right evidence. And this was touched on in Karlsruhe, but because of the, full, the wealth of material that was discussed, that wasn't at the center of the debate, but that is a problematic thing as well. If you would like to defend yourself with your lawyer, you have to have a certain amount of certainty that data wasn't placed or deleted or modified on the system. So you have the securing of evidence here, the, the provability of evidence. That wasn't such a big issue in 2008, because this was not about the Federal Criminal Police Office law, but it was about the law of the Interior Secret Service of the state of Northern Westphalia. And in that kind of context, the provability of evidence was not as central because uh, that's uh, not as relevant for a criminal process, uh, for the at least for the defense. So uh, there were some political responses which I would like to touch on briefly because they played a role in the hearing. Um, for one thing, the concrete case that we didn't want to publish actually, but where the person concerned went to the public himself that person that uh, w was working in that pharmaceutical import-export company, this was a Bavarian case, and the Bavarian Federal State Criminal Police Office uh, admitted to the use of the state trojan, so the Bavarian uh, um, Data Protection Commissioner was asked to, um, to check the cases that were the procedures that were going on and the this has been done and the response the analysis has been published it's quite interesting to read there were certain flaws in the way the procedures could be inspected in retrospect data was just not available for insight uh, still it was quite interesting particularly if you read the analysis if you know the analysis of the state version by the ccc and that of course entered the proceedings because just the Bavarian and the Federal um, Data Protection Commissioner uh, handed in reports. So the second reaction was that the Interior Politics Committee of the Parliament asked for a report which was then classified as secret, but found its way into the public. You find that on ccc.de as well. So uh, in the files, if you are an expert, you find a huge, get a huge pile of paper, lots of paper. And it was in there, but in the version that it was published on CCCDE, because the secret uh, stamp wasn't there anymore, it could enter the files. So that, of course, is interesting too. Peter Shah, the Federal Data Protection Commissioner, published certain details about the practice in which the state trojan was used, which we as anal analyzers could not know. The transcription of a phone sex talk by a culprit uh, Recording this is actually illegal, but it was even transcribed as well. But there were certain things that we could only sus suspect, but then found confirmed in the report. So that report, of course, was ent entered that hearing as well. Uh, and uh, then there were certain promises. You remember that short episode in Berlin politics where Friedrich was our interior minister from the Bavarian conservatives, if you remember. Uh, and there was a lot of talk about verification. Uh, who who looks at the source code? Who can look at the source code? Uh, not just according with respect to the authorities, but also to the judges that will have to deal with these things. And the question which I uh, extracted from an interview shortly after the publication in October 2011, uh, whether anyone is actually able to verify that state written that was brought in from Digitask. And of course, the interior minister said, yes, surely. Uh, but in fact, until 2011, there was a license agreement with the Federal Criminal Police Office uh, for the state written by Digitask, which actually excluded, legally excluded access to the source code. So the information that Friedrich gave was, was factually wrong. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that Trojan had no way of um, deleting certain content that touches the core of privacy while keeping logging. Uh, so that core area question is important. The core area of private 
life is the is the legal term for someone's intimate intimate sphere, which is to be distinct, is, which is distinct from the privacy, the private sphere. So this is talks with very close friends or relatives about the, the core areas of 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 life. Um, like a, it's a typically legalese term, but I find it quite fitting if you think about it. This core area is protected in a way that it's connected to human dignity at Article 1 of the German Constitution, cannot be violated. So the question of deleting this data was important. I'll come back to that core area later because the two central points were debated quite intensely here. I can't really, uh, in that breadth that it was covered in the hearing, I can't really repeat that because the essence and the implications to the future for in, of infiltration of our computers and, and all information technology systems, not just about computers, but all systems um, that will be relevant. I want to stress that all of the um, measures that were legal uh, later known had been conducted um, after judges had ordered them, but that um, shows that um, you know the the political argument of the um, of the judges forbade judges privilege, I don't know judges privilege uh, isn't doesn't always work, and even because of the uh, factual possibility of checking these. There were some other, I'll, I'll speak about the hearing later, really. There were some political promises, and I have to I have to speak about these so you know which weren't delivered. And it was promised that, um, you know, you have to give something, some certain things to the press, and they promised that um, present solutions, software solutions, would be evaluated throughout Germany, and that there would be a standardized description of their um, their possibilities, and there would be a process of um, quality assurance under um, with uh, an expert um, an expert team. But uh, nobody's talking about this today. It, it sort of got lost. But this standardized description of um, of, um, of capabilities uh, is takes about ten pages in the uh, in the pertinent documents, and the second important promise was that they would begin developing the software themselves, especially um, in the. Uh, for the source um, telecommunication surveillance and in the uh, Center for Informational IT Competence in the um, German Secret Service. Um, and I should remind you that um, the ruling in 2008 was before the Federal Criminal Police Office law, and when it was published, there was this new debate about IT security and malware as part of the Snowden revelation. So lots of changes happened, and there was a certain change in the way uh, spying software was viewed. Uh, it's not just about the publication of the state Trojan uh, by the CCC. There have been others from Citizen Web or the, this has become something like a transport among activists. So this ended. This all entered the debate in a certain way. Of course, you have to keep in mind that first of all, these are legal experts debating, which in which you into which you can try and include certain technical details to influence decisions, perhaps, or make them enter decisions. Contrary to what was promised, uh, it was in fact that the Digitask Trojan was put into the files and uh, the 
authorities then bought the state children by Finn, Finisher, Finn Fisher and, and the Gamma Eleman company. I have, so we have this, this dialogue between netspolitik.org and the Federal Criminal Police Office, but also we've got the data from the hacking team hack. So the Federal Criminal Police Office stretched out its fingers uh, asking uh, other companies for their work on sp sp espionage software. So um, in the hearing, some, at least two from the uh, German authority on in, uh, informational security, uh, IT security, uh, stressed that it would, it were, that self-development, their own development was uh, mainly what it was about. Um, on the other hand, we knew that meetings had been taken place with these companies, money was being paid. So, um, um, They kept stressing that the criminal police office was now into developing software themselves. I would like to mention another paragraph in the law about the Federal Criminal Police Office, 20K. This is the one that allows uh, searching information, IT systems. In the 2008 ruling, uh, there are issues that have been copied into the new law to, to follow the ruling there. So there is... Uh, um, uh, a broad definition of espionage software and the kind of devices that it can be applied to. So these are terms that are not uh, from the authorities but from the ruling uh, because judges then understood that they were not just talking about PCs. So they put all kinds of IT systems into their new fundamental right, which was quite far-sighted in my view. Uh, we keep talking about computers, but we have to remember that uh, all kinds of devices that are like computers uh, are relevant. Now, this distinction, I've talked about it already, it's no clearer than it was between source telecommunication surveillance and online searching. Uh, so the actual step, the actual violation of the fundamental right, we think is the actually actual inf infiltration of the system, not what happens then. But l legally, of course, there is this distinction, which mostly the authorities like to stress. They like to say, oh, this is just telecommunications surveillance, nothing else, which, of course, is not the case. I, for example, have this example of the application shots that uh, can be part of telecommunication surveillance from a straight token, and that contains information about the running system that um, are not about telecommunication. And that, of course, is a problem which technically is very hard to solve because there is no real semantics in this SBNR software. There is no real distinction to what kind of meaning of data we're talking about. Uh, this function has simply been programmed into, there is no way of this, uh, this telling which is running where on the computer and, and which data you're recording. And uh, this analog analogy that uh, to, to paper that, we are, uh, that I've got in this slide here is not really from me. <clears throat> um, so this, this source telecommunications surveillance, which can be not just Skype and other telephony, but, but anything uh, compared to a letter on paper, uh, this would be the equivalent of reading that paper as it is written on the desk before it is sent. So that would mean that all previous versions are being read as well. If I delete things in the email that I write, that, uh, or, or if I don't send it at all, uh, if you register what someone's typing, you don't know what is being communicated and actually sent. So these are difficult questions technically, and uh, it's often stressed that they are trying to find technical solutions for that. But in my point of view, this is not really possible. If you have a browser window with a screencast, you record it, it's impossible to, to decide whether what's being typed is ever going to enter communication or not, because that is only happening if someone decides whether to send the email or not. Okay. I'm going to talk about the hearing a bit. As I said, it went for ever, several hours. I would like to mention two things. This wonderful image here, the Data the Protection Commissioner, Andrea Voss, and uh, Voshoff, sorry, and our interior minister, Thomas de Maizier, who is mostly conspicuous by her absence. She wasn't there at the hearing. 
what's also conspicuous is that the interior minister did show up. I've seen many hearings in Kurt's Hall where the concerned ministers did not were not present, and it went as far as the representative of the government, Christoph Müller's, uh, the authorized representative, uh, simply skipped his introductory statement, which had been prepared, and and the interior minister. Uh, held a political speech rather than a legal argument as an introductory statement. So our previous experience, I'm not a lawyer, but I have been in Karlsruhe several times attending those hearings, and ministers were not there, and uh, this was clearly a political, that too is a political, political statement, but this was interesting for the press if the minister is actually there and holds a speech in which he mainly said that without the Federal Criminal Police Office law, uh, the ISIS terror would be present in Germany by now, and uh, there were about 340 threats in Germany that are being pursued, no more than that. And he also said that less than five te source telecommunication surveillance cases were taking place. So this was used very sparingly, but uh, that didn't convince the uh, legal people because this is not about the practice, it's about the admissibility uh, what is actually admitted in the law, permitted. So I've got the uh, outline here of, of, of the debate. I brought it here just to see for you to see how these things go. So you have formalia, and then you have introductory statements, uh, and then Burkhard Hirsch and Sönke Hilbrands, the two complainants, uh, with their arguments, which were somewhat different. And then there was these hours. There were these hours of constitutional evaluation, constitutional legal evaluation. So they were talking about technical authorization. What are the uh, preconditions? What are the technical conditions? What, what about the practice, both administratively and technologically? And then an important point was protecting the core area of life, technically, practically, and in the law. How is this being implemented? And this is different for the different paragraphs of the law, particularly 20, there were different uh, letters or for the different sections for the different means that are allowed. And, and there are certain differences in, in the preconditions. And then uh, people with, with professional secrets, uh, like doctors, lawyers, many lawyers present, of course, that again was sing a section separated out and uh, uh, part of several constitution complaints beforehand uh, that privileged uh, pr uh, those that carry professional secrecy. And the third part that was a bit shorter uh, is notification obligations, um, spying, uh, eavesdropping on, f on homes, uh, dragnet surveillance, what about legal recourse, um, uh, would have been interesting to get a statement from the data protection commissioner who was not present. What about auditing? What about logging and deleting? And then uh, the last one uh, was about transmitting the data in in within the country. Um, about changing the purpose of uh, transfer, and then a part about transfer to uh, other to the foreign countries. Because you know that authorities cooperate, but this was dealt with much shorter, and the Trojan was mainly present in items one and two, or relevant in those. Uh, just very briefly, I would like to outline our arguments. Uh, I had, the, I was fortunate in the fact that I was able just to mention these orally. And um, all the experts cannot always be certain that they are, they'll be allowed to submit their arguments. That's um, partly due to the amount of question, but also due to how the hearings were led. It's not always very structured. There's first um, preliminary meeting, and um, the, um, the the hordes of um, governmental representatives and every and. They uh, stressed that they wanted a dialogue, and you know it's more of a more of a yeah more of a dialogue. Um, I was quite lucky because I my contributions came fairly early, and because uh, the interest in the technical facts is fairly large, the um, ref 
referee for the um, <laughs> had written a lot about um, the uh, about the legal question and uh, but the quest the technical questions ha had a certain interest to them and I, I was lucky to uh, stress them I just want to give you uh, give you give you an excerpt and um, the Difficulties between um, the uh, castrated straight tro children and the online um, surveillance is that, uh, from a technical perspective, we have to say that it's a purely technical restriction that doesn't make a lot of sense from a technical point of view. The risks we talked about, the risks that are connected to this, and um, the debate on the on the uh, purchase of uh, these exploits, I mean, should the state sponsor the black market? Um, we think that by allowing this um, this black market to exist, we're opening new holes in IT security. We also talked about the core area. So how can we tell the, an espionage software that this is where privacy begins? It's not always like, uh, easy to translate this because the idea of of letting software know you know know what a human person is talking about is a sort of science fiction, and you know it's uh, there's this belief that software knows what people are talking about and talking about this was important to us in, in turn. And then of course there was a question of the source code, who is looking at it, who can uh, use the binaries later. How can we um, how can we uh, prevent this? Is the um, solution that um, you know of, of having a common common certification for everything Then there's the question of uh, service providers, because the hacking team hack was a good example that showed um, some processes that happen in this market where these exploits are sold, uh, that is mainly financed by public money, which showed these in turn have security problems, not only delivering shoddy quality but also having security holes and we try to bring this into the hearing because the, the question of which surveillance we want to allow is is this not We're not talking about suspects, we're talking about preventive measures where no concrete suspicion exists, just uh, certain threats perhaps. So how, when do you actually, when have you actually fully investigated or uh, elucidated them? Um, and that third guideline from, from the old ruling from 2008 is something I'd like to remind us of because uh, surely our computers, mobile phones, our external brains contain lots of private stuff, but also intimate stuff in that, uh, in that legal sense, data, movies, communication, which was stressed as early as 2008 in that first ruling. So very clearly in that third guideline, uh, a law that allows intrusions like that has to have provisions to protect the core area of private of the private life, and that did not happen at all, and at least not in, a, in particularly not in a consistent way. So to look into the crystal ball for a while, I think that core area protection will be a very critical point in the ruling, and I'm sure that the Federal Criminal Police Office law will be partly ruled unconstitutional. The arguments in the hearing from the Interior Ministry and the uh, representatives of the government were 
pretty much taken apart and uh, it seemed clear uh, in particular because certain technical me measures did not really in any way regulate access to that core or non-access to the core area of private life so that will surely make the whole law fail on that account but of course uh, the ruling will not on the other hand state Trojan into the bin completely, which of course is what I would like to hope for, but in my view, uh, the question how they can put into a law how this infiltration can protect human dignity in this way, that will be a central item. Uh, so, uh, well, I'll skip uh, the way it's derived, but um, uh, they have to kind of predict how in a technical surveillance measure uh, content from that private that core area could be involved and that contained and that was then it was an interesting question here in Karlsruhe how about automized recording so uh, could that perhaps uh, protect the core area because uh, but then the uh, complainants very pretty much went up in arms against that because that would of course also affect that core area uh, so it has to be said, this material cannot be, must not be recorded in the first place, whatever the uh, charge, the possible charge could be. So because that area is something that we, uh, that we grant every person, every human being, and these are people that haven't, and are not under concrete suspicion. So uh, this will be an interesting item. Uh, and it also is about deleting of notes and transcripts by uh, um, civil servants. And I'd like to talk about the near future uh, that in Karlsruhe wasn't debated at such intensity. For one thing, what will be the kind of IT systems that they might want to infiltrate? That, of course, is an open question, which was debated in 2008 already. But in those years, a lot of things, a lot of technological developments have happened. And what area of life will not be digitized in the near future? That is a very interesting question that in Karlsruhe, even at the, micro, at the, at the census ruling in, to, in, in the 1980s was considered. So the question of human-machine symbiosis would an infiltration uh, be something like uh, uh, physical harm? Would that equate to physical harm? Because we are talking about, uh, I don't know, hearing aids that could be monitored, uh, attacking someone not just in terms of their dignity, but also in their physical health. So concrete, in concrete, that will not play a major role, but the debate about this is one that we should not um, shy away from in the future. So this, in more or less, is my summary. Of course, I am aware that many aspects that were talked about uh, of a legal nature is something that I haven't talked about. Of course, there have been reports, but there has not been a detailed protocol. So there's no way of, of uh, to to really read about the the many details that were talked about, but in autumn and winter, when we have the ruling, we can read the uh, details, the the written ruling, and we can make sure that the public will know about this. And this is a, a ruling that will come, and the consequences will be interpreted. And we have to make sure that there's going to be a public debate, and the interpretation. Uh, will not just be put down into the files and uh, we can't allow them to say, okay, we've done things wrong and um, everyone will say, the complainants as well as the government will say they are happy with the ruling, surely. So we'll have to make sure that we uh, are part of those that interpret the ruling, read the ruling and create publicity and n not allow the state interpretation to become normality uh, if the military now starts about um, not just if, if if police authorities enter this market as well, there's, there's going to be no way of reining this in. There's going to be companies like Gamma and Hacking Team that will be spreading. And my call on all of you and everyone that uh, are part of public discourse, make sure that you notice when the ruling comes and make sure that the state urgent is not going to become a part of everyday life. 
and I would like to stress again, and no one will be surprised by me saying this, in particular after, in particular after this hearing, I am more than ever of the conviction that state infiltration of IT system, systems cannot be legally admissible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Constanze. We've now got about 15 minutes left for questions and answers, but before that, there's a short announcement from security. And we would like the driver of the vehicle, BJF236, to, <laughs> to uh, call Honkaze at 110 on the deck. She pretended that she was that driver, but she probably isn't. So that, that driver's blocking about 400 other vehicles. So if you still want to ask questions, uh, please do. I know I always talk very quickly, but if there are any questions left, please ask them. Either now, but I'll, I'm always here. If you have any questions, uh, go to the microphones and we'll start. I have a question about the notifications after the measures. Is, this, is, is it not true that this doesn't even happen today with normal teleco telecom surveillance? Well, yeah, even for the state Trojan, uh, there is a notification obligation. It, this is also, it also refers to the telecommunication surveillance and all other eavesdropping. But in all laws, and this law as well, there are exemptions. Uh, this can be suspended for certain legal reasons, mostly concerning uh, investigations that still are ongoing against other people, perhaps. So there are always three or four reasons to exempt. Uh, concretely about the state Trojan, I don't know a single case that where notification took place, but I don't, of course, the number of cases overall is not very high of users. A question you talked about the Federal uh, Ministry of the Interior had um, had travel to cards were in hordes, and you talked about the unusual process that the uh, Minister of the Interior arrived himself, but not the um, privacy data protection minister. Do the, do they all have to um, to to come individually or? Um, were these people from the uh, from the uh, constitutional part of the uh, Ministry of the Interior or from the authority as well? I don't know if this is of, a, is of a general interest, but I can take two minutes to explain. Uh, first of all, in the last few years, I've noticed that if, if technical surveillance is concerned, we of course deal with other things as well. There's always. There is a, a wish by the judges to invite people from from the practice, from, from, and that's happened with the Federal Criminal Police Office. There were people there that actually dealt with the, the use of the surveillance because judges would like to hear how these things go in practice. And personally, I have to say, uh, I'm more and more annoyed about this because it takes up a lot of room. It has nothing to do with the legal deliberations. Of course, they always assure you that they are very careful about these things, but these are not legal questions at all. Uh, the, the, the law can say something completely different, and it all has a very calming effect, but the judges would like to hear about this practice. And then there was the Federal Office for Information Security, a whole bunch of people that were that dealt with this. Uh, the, the speaker of the interior ministry, for example, the, the fact that the minister spoke himself uh, is more important for public relations work because that attracts the press. Well, the reporting about is this is enhanced if the minister personally defends this, although he personally was not in office at the time. But this, he he ha basically gave a political speech was was quite. A 
particular one, of course, as the law was made, uh, there were no, um, what, I didn't catch that. Uh, he didn't talk about legal arguments at all, but uh, basically he, oh, ISIS didn't exist at the time, so he, this was the fact that he, he entered this, this fear of, of this fear argument uh, concerning ISIS and stuff. On the other hand, I have to say, uh, of course you have the uh, right and left sides in Karlsruhe, you have the judges on one side, and the defenders of freedom on the one side, and, and police sympathizers on the other. And that, of course, involves a lot of people too. And, and then there were data protection commissioners from, from federal states, um, the complainants, and in part also uh, next to those that handed in the complaints pers in person, there were those that, uh, the, the lawyers, so that's the other side. So there's about 20 minutes to introduce everyone in the beginning. Uh, but there are some on the interior ministers, ministry side that do not get introduced from the lower ranks. Uh, right, um, you do, you should go. If you're in Karlsruhe, go to one of these events. It's interesting for techies as well. You can, you can get a place there in the audience. Any further questions? Come to the microphones, please. On the left or the right. The mass to find its way from the very middle of the second row to the aisles. He's made it. You talked about the fact that there aren't that many cases of the use of the state trojan yet. Is there a dedicated statistics on, a statistic on this, uh, like with normal um, normal eavesdropping? Yes and no. After the October 2011 revelations, there were parliamentary questions after we, re we revealed the state trojans uh, from different federal states and from the federal authorities to um, the federal police, uh, customs police. So they were adding up with the state authorities, which had been using Trojans. But there is no official statistic because police matters are federal state matters, in particular Secret Service. But the federal authorities that I mentioned uh, did mention numbers, and thus that was just one case of an online search since 2009, and less, about four, I think, you can count the, on the fingers of one hand, source telecommunication surveillance. And it was stressed that the Digitask Trojan was not no longer be used, but uh, what the hearing was talk, t talking about only concerns federal authorities. We don't really know what happens at the federal state level. Uh, we think, because there were uh, struggles or debates in certain states and, uh, and judges uh, deal with these things differently now, so things may change. We tallied everything together and had over 80 since 2009? No. Um, uh, really, since 2010, because the queries in Parliament had different dates, uh, depending on on the time frames in the parliamentary questions in the different parliaments. And not up to 2015 either, but about 2013 after that, the topic kind of vanished again. So three and a half years, roughly. I don't know any more detail. If anyone knows more, I'm always open for more information. And we're still accepting binaries as well. I have a funny story. Well, maybe not. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Um, we had, the time was incredibly short, three and a half weeks for handing in our expertise. Uh, normally, it would take more than 10 months, so that was really stressful. So a week before we were actually writing things up, and uh, uh, these were the hot days, we actually received a hard disk with the binaries of a state malware. And we were very excited, and, and we we're going to go there and, and bring that this Trojan with us. But it turned out differently. But we are to accept binaries. Uh, 
It seems as though there are no further questions, so give a huge thanks to Constanza.